five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. You're listening to Tabletop and Beyond with your host, Justin. But before we get started, how was your Geek Week? And co-hosts, Dan and Jason. You have to be willing to let the dice help you tell the story. Okay, look, this year, I'm going to stop mispronouncing words. Join us as we cover board games to war games and beyond. And welcome back to Tabletop and Beyond. This is Talking Warhammer. I'm your host, Justin, and I'm here with my special guest, James O'Brien. James, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Justin. It's great to be on again. Uh, yeah, I mean, you weren't on too long ago, were you? Nope. nope. <laughs> uh, I was on last year talking about, I think, Warhammer tournaments, funnily enough. Yes. Yeah, and guess what we're talking about today? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the season, though, and we've it got is. a lot of big ones coming up. We do indeed. Um, I, already this year we've had LVO, and then just this last weekend we had Adepticon, uh, and uh, then we've got all of the Warhammer, um, the Games Workshop US Opens um, coming up as well, and of course, um, near and dear to us, uh, the, the Nova Open. That's right. Uh, so many big tournaments to go to, so little time. Uh, you know, and that's not to mention all the little RTTs that happen, uh, so mm -hmm. you can tune up for the big ones. But uh, a lot of good Warhammer to be happening in 2022, and it's about time, right? It certainly is. Yeah, um, it was a it was a tough couple of years for everybody without without the the, the major events running uh, and the opportunity to see your friends from around the country and around the world, um, as as everybody felt. Um, yeah, so it's be it's great to have uh, events back in in full force. So before we get into the show, uh, you, you know, we're going to be talking about you as a tournament organiz mm -hmm. organizer a little bit, but uh, you are also a player. What do you got on your hobby bench right now? Uh, I have a couple of things, um, and it's more, it's not so much for my own armies, but things that I've been inspired by just recently. So I, uh, at Adepticon this weekend from the GW store there, I picked up the... Uh, the Gaunt's Ghosts, um, oh yeah, forty very k cool. box because yep. I've I've been reading those books, um, and so I was inspired to pick those guys up. And also, I just this evening picked up a um, Mind Stealer Sphinx, which yes, is a, a, a war cry monster, but was the single most submitted model into the Golden Demon Awards just hosted this last weekend at Adepticon. I'm not which, surprised. It is a gorgeous model. It's an absolutely fantastic model, and I was so inspired by the Golden Demon entries uh, for this model in particular that I was like, right, I'm going to pick one up, I'm going to paint it, it's going to be bad, I'm going to get another one, I'm going to paint it, it's going to be slightly <laughs> better, and so on and so on and so on and so on. Um, so yeah, I picked up my first Mind Stealer Sphinx tonight um, from uh, Game Castle um, in College Park, Maryland. Very cool. Um, it is an absolute beast in Warcry. Is it? It's uh, good, is it? Yeah, some some of those uh, Warcry specific models are okay, you mm -hmm. know, like um, they'll they'll do some stuff, but that one is uh, it it can um, wreak some havoc. And they changed some of the rules in Warcry about being able to take allies and monsters and things okay. like that. So some of the underpowered Warcry specific factions, like mm. the Untamed Beasts or the Iron Golems, really benefit from that okay. that model in particular. Yeah. You know, so um, makes some uh, makes some such a beautiful model. Like yeah. um, the uh, for those of you who, who've got got had the opportunity to look at, it, if you look at the Golden Demon Awards, the uh, the I think it was the runner up in Age of Sigmar large model was a pink painted mind stealer Sphinx um, mm -hmm. by a French artist called uh, Alexis Lulier, and it was my single favorite model in Golden Demon this year. I saw the picture and it was gorgeous. The picture it does it does it no justice at all. That's the closer you the closer you get to that model, the more you see. The, 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 this artist is able to paint fur textures onto flat models. Wow. And more importantly, a number of artists do that, but he kept it in scale, so his fur marks were so fine that they looked model scale appropriate as fur. It was absolutely incredible. That did not come through in the picture. 
Um, and, it does not, and you also can't you know. see the eyes, which were the second most striking feature of the uh, of, of the model, which he named he named Inez after his own pet cat at home in France. <laughs> That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Well, we're going to talk a little bit more about the Golden Demon because I know that you were um, involved in that. Um, I was, so, yeah. yeah. Um, that, that's a, like my last last weekend and most of last week. I, I was at Adepticon, um, supporting Games Workshop. I do um, I, I do work on a part time basis for Games Workshop to specifically to support events. Um, and what my first event of the year for Games Workshop was uh, was Adepticon. So I went there really more as general help than uh, in my normal sort of Age of Sigma tournament organizer capacity. Um, so my main job for most of the week was to to do all the admin for uh, for Golden Demon. So I was I was taking people's entries in, I was getting them in the cabinet, I was getting them from the cabinet to the judging table. Then I was ma- ensuring that the right people were collecting the models at the end after the judging. Um, so it was quite nerve wracking to handle eight hundred Golden Demon entries <laughs> multiple times <laughs> over the course of say, a weekend. Did you have like 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 white gloves and you know uh, yeah like I, I, guards, I, like exactly you know. I, I had I had gloves on. We did have twenty four hour security on the Golden Demon booth. Um, so yeah, all of those things. Um, Games Workshop took good care of those models. Yeah, uh, you know it's funny because you would think like oh they're just painted models, but man, there's a lot of effort that goes into those things. You there's know? um there's an incredible amount of effort um the one of the one of the artists um and i'll i'll get his name right i'll i'll I'll, uh, I'll i'll come back to it but um he entered most categories um and he entered most of his um uh, most of his most of his his entries on day one and he said here's about 1000 hours of my work wow. and then he came back on day two with a single um diorama so probably the biggest single category of entries is 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 the diorama right right um so he came back with his his diorama um and he said and here's the other thousand hours of my entry oh Um, my gosh so that one alone was 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 the same as um and it was the third place diorama so if you go to the games workshop uh warhammer community website and look Mm -hmm. through the golden dean results the bronze dia uh Di- bronze winning diorama by Mamicon. Um, that was the one where he said, "This is a thousand hours of my work," um, and I was like, "Okay, I best not drop this then." As I placed, as I placed the very tall model <laughs> right. in in the very short cabinet uh, that that it just about scraped through underneath uh, between the shelves. Um, yeah, so it was uh, it was it was it was intense, but it was in equal parts intimidating to how far we as journeyman painters have got to go to reach that level, but also incredibly inspiring. So like I've thought about, I'm thinking about models in a different way already Yeah. in terms of what I could produce with my own modest level of painting skill. And I'm, I'm going to enter next year. I'm going to enter next year. Like I'm not going to win anything, but I'm yeah, sufficiently but... inspired by that, that I'm going to enter. I'm going to, I'm going to enter capital palette at Nova now as well. I did a few years ago. I won a, a, a little pin for that. A, uh, a little medal for for a bronze level entry um and so i'm going to be back into these painting competitions having been inspired by the incredible incredible talent that was on display in, uh, in the golden demon awards uh tell you what i will enter with you cool awesome let's that'll do be it. great let's do let's it let's do it i will yep. paint up my ogroid myrmidon that was the other product. model i was after no way yep. Yep. <laughs> i will i've got it that's right an incredible model me. too oh i love it so I have it right here in front of me. It's all gray, mm-hmm. ready to be painted, staring at me. So I'll come up with a thing and I'll put it in the cap in the um, in the in capital, capital palette. palette. Well, yep, yep. Fantastic. Did it, it wasn't used to the crystal brushes. Where's the crystal brush at? Crystal brush was the old Adepticon paint event. Oh, okay, that's right. That's right. So so games uh, Golden Demon is now the Adepticon and obviously Games Workshop painting competition. Because there was the Golden Demon in England for like a long Correct. time, right? And yeah. I, I'd assume I don't know the details. Apologies, uh, I don't know the details. I'd assume there is still a Golden Demon at, um, in the UK. Normally, they have it in their like Warhammer Weekender or Horus Heresy Weekender or Games Day UK. Uh, the yeah. big events that Games Workshop run in the UK, they roll in um, Golden Demon to that. And the the great part about the Adepticon Golden Demon was it because it was at a 
sort of five day long convention there was three days for artists to submit models and then the judges oh, had a full 24 hours to to judge the uh the pieces before the award ceremony on the sunday who uh so who were the judges they were in-house um games workshop studio folks oh, okay okay cool. so uh the head judges is um is a long time games workshop uh heavy metal painter and studio artist um called aiden aiden's now moved to the community team and does a lot of the warhammer tv stuff oh okay um, so he he ran it and then there was a couple of folks over from the uk as well who helped judging uh, some of the, the more senior games workshop people and they took a solid six hours from the awards from the entries closing they sat down and they went through all 13 categories over the course of six hours to select their their winning entries in each category and then the following morning they came back and did it again for their final wow. few just to make sure that they were making the right calls for each and every category it was um it's fantastic it like it's it's really good there's there's no there's not an explicit set of criteria um yeah. by which they're they're judging it's but it is very clearly a painting competition versus a modeling or converting right or doing a, something cool and crazy so when you look at the the award-winning entries so the overall slayer sword winner was a first-time entrant it was a skink painted by a young artist called gavin gaza um and the reason it won it was it's it's a skink it's a regular little skink it's right, the, right. Like, it's it's 15 millimeters high it's a tiny little model but because it was so perfectly immaculately painted every detail was absolutely correct on it that was it this is a painting competition so it was the the best painted miniature so that was the yeah. that was the slayer sword winner you know um like you wouldn't have as a, if you'd had a casual walk around the cabinets i doubt very much that you would have picked that out immediately as the slayer sword winner yeah but the artistry and the pure painting ability that was displayed on that model meant that, that that was the that was the winner that was the best in show my favorite part of that little model you know looking at the picture and i'm again i'm sure the picture doesn't do it justice but um is the little glint of light off of the, off tip, the, of the tip of the blade yeah and you're like at first i'm like oh wow that's shiny wait that's not shiny that's not no. right like paint is it shiny like that and um i mean just like that right there is so well executed yep you know you th you don't think and, and you know it's well executed when you look at it and you don't think twice about it you're like oh wow that's just that thing right yeah. and you kind of move on and you go back and you're like wait a minute knowing like what it took to get that like that's really impressive really really yeah. impressive and and like the, I, I really did find a, a, a sort of a passion for the the golden demon awards this weekend like some of the things that and it was great to meet all the artists um because although i had no influence over the judging whatsoever they were they're obviously quite keen to they could see that i was supporting it and they were quite keen to sort of get my impression spend some time with me i i felt really privileged to be a part of it um yeah and i didn't drop any of the models so that was good <laughs> step one step right? one <laughs> yep um and yeah it was it was fantastic like it was such a good experience the um uh, one last anecdote from uh, from golden demon yeah um the winning Middle Earth strategy battle miniature is a is one of the, uh, you know, where Aragorn goes through the cracks and he commands them to come and help him, um, in yeah. in the the Return, Return of the King. Of the King. Yep. Um, it's one of the uh, it's one of the, the the leaders of of that sort of skeletal ghost army, and the gentleman uh, James Cordwell is the artist placed it down on the desk in front of me and another GW colleague Chantel, um, and it was facing towards him. And as I turned, as I spun it round, and please look at this picture on the on the. On I'm the looking at it there. right now. Yeah. As I spun it round to see that model, my jaw dropped, and Chantal next to me, her jaw dropped, and James said that was the expect the the the, uh, the reaction I was hoping for, <laughs> as, 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 as we turned it round. You know, it was yeah. amazing. It was that was such. I was like, whoa, this is incredible. You know. Um, the ghosty effects that he did are absolutely stunning on that yeah you know and it's not um 
it's not like true OSL that he did with it. Like, no. like it's fading into the cloth, you know, like mm -hmm. it, it looks r really amazing. Um, and that like the, the metal pieces, right? Like the crown and the, the bracers yep. and like, they're kind of desaturated because of the ghostly uh, light yep. that they have. It looks really good. And I love, love, love underneath like the skulls and the sword. The skulls right? and the sword. Yeah. Oh, oh, so good. It still looks so good. <laughs> yeah that's um, fantastic it was, yeah it was that that was great that was that was a really cool moment um and I, w I would i would recommend people go and see it see this stuff in person because there's so much that the um that the pictures don't pick out like there's so many of them that that are just superb and, and a single picture doesn't do justice to it like will Hahn's silver for warhammer 40k vehicle the uh the, the sister of battle in the in the little walker suit unbelievable the face on that model oh yeah yeah is, i saw that it's 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 amazing and I, I know will i hands up i do know will uh he painted that in two and a half weeks specifically for this competition it's stunning it's incredible the diorama the winning diorama from oh, yeah. um, andy wardle andy wardle there was no good angle <laughs> to take a photo of that diorama but if you <laughs> spin that round 90 degrees either way those branches make a forced perspective that yeah. sort of zoom you in. It's like you're watching a horror movie and the, 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 these branches are sort of tunneling your view in yep. to the things that are happening. And, and you can't see it in that picture, but the little, the little vampire bat dude that's, that's killed the damsel in distress there, there's a hole punched through her chest where he's pulled her heart out. And oh the, the trail... I can see the the trail of blood leads down around from her into the river that's running down the middle that the that the witch hunters are standing in oh, and you wow. can just about see on the picture you can see the glow from his torch on the snow yeah um it's amazing it was incredible oh i see that i didn't pick that up before yeah it's a um, little oh wow it's it's such a superb piece of like dynamic art it's incredible um yeah, it was um, it was it was a real privilege to be part of Golden Dugan. Uh, and kind of very cool that you know, like, uh, not a happy ending here <laughs> in that diorama. No, no, there is not a happy ending in that diorama. <laughs> I mean, I like, I believe in uh, in uh, the the Van Gents, the two witch hunters. They're in this yeah. in this diorama. They're pretty badass. Um, yeah. Like in 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 AOS, like for named characters, they get a bit of table time, particularly uh, Doralia, the the daughter. Uh -huh. she's 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 pretty good in aos so I, I i would back her to take them with that with that crossbow she'd, yeah, unfortunately she'd... they didn't get to the damsel in time they though, did huh? not get to the damsel in, in time <laughs> they did not spoiler alert for anybody yeah. who's gonna look this up the yeah. she didn't make it <laughs> she didn't make it so so you spent i mean pretty much all your time there with the golden demon stuff like did you have time to kind of walk around and check I out the did, other events? yeah i did um i did a couple of days on um on games workshops uh on our, on our quick reaction force so our, our our staff that could go and support any of the gw uh activities at um at adepticon so i spent time at the store we had a great um a great store there tons of forge world stock um constant lines of, of customers coming through to yeah. pick up their forge world bits and their event exclusive bits um so that was cool um learning a bit more about the retail side uh, i spent time supporting a couple of the there was a couple of tiny tournaments that gw ran on behalf of adepticon so kill team and oh nice uh, and underworld uh, gw provided staff to, to run those events um then we had kill team live which is our laser tag experience um, yeah which was cool so i uh, i learned to um to support and, and run that um and then we had uh, uh we just had sort of social events for different groups for playtesters for influencers for tos um so I, I i supported those in the evenings as well so i got to sort of bounce around everything that games workshop was doing uh, at adepticon um over the course of four or five days so it was it was a great experience and it was good to be able to support that uh legendary convention you know i've been as a player a couple of times right um so it was nice to go uh, see a bit more of uh of how the sausage is made with adepticon I was going to say, you got like the backstage view of like pretty much the whole I thing. I did, yeah. Um, so from setting stuff up in the vendor hall on the Wednesday through running the preview on the Wednesday night. Um, and there was a great preview, like tons of interesting stuff was announced uh, on Wednesday night at Adepticon. Um, 
from new necromunda through the relaunch of the horus heresy game the next edition of that right. through... that cinematic was pretty amazing oh it was wasn't it yeah through yeah. chaos knights hitting 40k new knights and new chaos knights books um through the new season of war for aos there was a load of of, of cool stuff for the uh, that was previewed um and announced at, a, at, a, at adepticon as well so it was yeah it was really good yeah so um speaking of some of those announcements mm -hmm. uh i've got kind of a theory and maybe you can back me up on this and and i talked a little bit about it with lee uh, reese in our last episode um so the stronghold of thandia right the thandia yep. stronghold um it was announced there and i feel like that should have come out like six months ago you know um, with, with i don't know like um i feel like because for example we have the arena of shades box mm -hmm. set coming out right which is night hunt and daughters of kane okay. which, yep. which means we have our books coming out probably hopefully not too much further um after they they get the box set gets released yeah because it's you know the night hunt dok books mm -hmm. um my thought this is again my theory this is my tinfoil hat is on right there's no monsters in both the night hunt and pretty much dok armies that's so, mercy yeah, minus Marathi, right? Um, but Night Hunt has no monsters except for the Morngul. So yep. I was thinking that that's a perfect opportunity to switch seasons and move into a different realm. Maybe one that's got a little bit more magic or something like that. It's right? not quite. It's not quite switching realms because Thondir is a region within. Right. Gur. So it's 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 switching seasons. There you go. Within yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so oh, I so think... they'll so, so do you think they'll stay in Gur and not um, switch I mean, seasons yeah, with so, the realm? So so Gur is um, sorry, Thondia. Yeah. Is is a plains in the middle of Gur. Yeah, um, yeah. One of like the subcontinents or something exactly, like that, right? Yeah. Um, so that will give, and this box set gives the opportunity for non-monster having armies to have this kind of like summoned monster yeah and it's paired with a hero who's uh who's who's summoning it um there was quite a quite a long story on bell of lost souls about it today about oh, okay. how that mechanic is going to work yeah yeah we're seeing that it kind of eats uh endless spells it looks it like it does eat endless spells yeah um yeah so another and it, it powers up through eating endless spells i think there must okay. be other ways of doing it i'm not entirely sure like i don't yeah, yeah i've yeah. deliberately stayed away from the playtesting side of things um <laughs> because like i want to play myself um, right and i want to keep running events for gw so i i don't necessarily want to commit that extra time that that to do that properly requires a lot of time um you know, you have to really commit to it. And I, I don't know that I've got that much more bandwidth between trying to progress my own playing career and also then running events for <laughs> right, Nova right. Games Workshop, <laughs> my own company, you know? Um, yeah. There's, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of, war, <laughs> a lot a lot of, of Warhammer in my life already. <laughs> uh, and I think uh, playtesting would be, would be one stage uh, too far. Sorry yeah. to Chuck. If Chuck Moore listens, I'm sorry, Chuck. I can't do it. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's fair enough. Uh, I I definitely hear you on that. So I, I'm excited to see what this, you know, Thandia Stronghold does. Like yep. what you know, what what it comes out with, and uh, I'm excited for the upcoming year. Uh, and you know, whether or not we switch seasons or like what that means, um, because I think that uh, like. You know, I was thinking Night Hunt is not optimized for this season right now. Of so, course, I forgot you know. you're a, you're primarily a Night Hunt player, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, I've been running orcs lately. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, I got I got an orc set when that the last mm -hmm. um book came out. So that was like tw 2019. Yeah, it was 2019 because mm. I was going into 2020 with it. Um, and uh, but yeah, I I mean, Night Hunt was my first love. So yeah, you know, um. Yeah, I was just I like, think, how can well, I, run I think it now? I think Nighthorn are going to be good. Like, I really do. I like the look of those new crossbow dudes. I um, do too. Brings yeah. another dimension to Nighthorn. Um, even though haven't they said they hit on a four? But that's yeah. not the end of the, that's not the end of the world with in in AOS three point because you can always all out attack. You know. Um, oh yeah, definitely. So you can. And bring I think they've got to... some Ren too. So we'll yeah. see. We'll see how they end up. Um, 
you know, the, th- the fact is, is that Night Hunt had zero shooting before. Yes. Um, so, you know, that's a good yeah. thing mm-hmm. to add something, right? Some some sort of threat. So yeah. we'll see what the book does. I, I You know, Night Hunt needs a little bit of mortal, mortal wound support. Um, mm-hmm. And, um, I, you know, hopefully they can get some there. I, you know, obviously the hex rays have, you know, when you hit on sixes, like they'll, they'll do some mortal wounds, but yep. they only have a couple of attacks. So even if you've got 10 hex rays going on, like that's mm. 20 attacks, right? Like a, you're fishing for sixes, you're only getting like two to three, maybe, mm-hmm. you know? So, anyway. yeah. But it's all good. We'll we'll see what, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. We'll, we'll see what the new <laughs> book brings. I mean, like Nighthorn. Are- Yes, you have to play them with Nagash right now. I think yeah. uh, uh, Nate Trentinelli's LVO yes. list um, has demonstrated to people that you can you right. can make Nighthaunt competitive. You can do well with Nighthaunt. Um, you also kind of have to be Nate Trentinelli too to pull it off. Oh, yeah. yeah you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, he's just I mean, he's a fantastic general out there. Right. Oh, yeah. And he absolutely he's knows what player. he's doing. And so, mm-hmm. um you know, for him to put that list together and play it, it's kind of like Bill Souza. I put them in the same category, right? Where they can pick up pretty much any army and yeah. be like, "Yeah, I'll go like four and one, no big deal." Yeah, you know. Yeah, the um, I we are very lucky in the DC area that there is so much, so much good competitive practice. We had a mm-hmm. we had a, a training a training day up at um Hazar Hobbies a few weeks ago, and uh, Hazar Hobbies plug for that store, amazing store. Um, yeah, absolutely great location has a bar so it makes your training days go a, a lot more easily um so <laughs> a lot of great was, table space yeah they've got I, I mean i run 32 player tournaments there for them every quarter because yeah. they've got and then i have I, I still have a little bit of space to do judges stuff so yeah. they can do they could do 36 38 uh, in in hazar um and then on top of that they're still running a magic and D room alongside it they've got some <laughs> right. good space um so uh yeah, so I was lucky in like a training day, like you play like Nate Trentinelli, Mike Vaginos, you play like really high quality, like GT winning players, just like as a regular game on a right. Saturday afternoon or a Wednesday night, you know. Right. Um, yeah. So and like, a... oh yeah, I'll be there, no problem. And you're like, okay, it's like I'm in the final tables at, at yeah, LBO exactly. here, you know. <laughs> <Back> <laughs> on, it's round five at Summit Slaughter again, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so it's uh, it's we're very lucky to have uh, have so many really active and successful players uh, playing locally here. Um, but every I'm like every major sort of group within the within the within the country within the meta has those those players who are doing very well, and it's just a tribute and a testament to the growth of the game. Really, yeah, you for know? sure. Like some of the Texas players are really stepping up. Not just Gavin, but like who's obviously doing amazingly well at every tournament that he goes to. Um, but like a bunch of Gavin's um, colleagues in Harambe's Heroes and the other the other Texas teams there are doing superbly well. Yeah. Um, and then you've always had a strong West Coast, uh, both yep. the Northwest Jeremy Vessier and Alex Gonzalez and those guys, and then down in 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 San Diego the guys who are running actually coming across to run LVO from the West Coast, um, uh, Gareth Thomas and and and, and those guys uh, with their SoCal Masters like everywhere around the country there are really strong communities springing up so it's it's superb to see the growth of the game it really is well and it uh to build a little bit on what uh, i talked about with reese in our last podcast Mm -hmm. uh, a a big part of that growth uh as we mentioned was the fact that big events started to get standardized a little bit more yeah right uh it wasn't just like uh Okay, well, come here. Here's the here's the tournament packet lo- that looks wildly different than anything you've ever seen before. Mm-hmm. You know, like uh, Reese, Reese brought up like some packets would be like in turn three you get double movement, and in turn four you only get half movement. You know, and you're like, okay, like why did we do this? You know, for this yeah. tournament. And so, uh, you know, with the with the ITC, with um, you know some of these other opens that are happening, there seems to have been uh, a higher quality of play that has come out because yep. of the quality of tournaments that are being run and you know it's almost like su- success begets success and you know you're getting people who have been playing a long time that are really good but then you've got some up and comers that are also mm-hmm. really good that have been you know tested in the forge of you know these good events so um it, it, it's really nice to see yeah it's um it's definitely helping um, build b- 
big events mm -hmm. um, because when you've got a standardization of scoring, pairing, placing, players are going to have the confidence that th they understand what the game is going to look like and therefore they can play to their optimal skill level and therefore they're prepared to travel to have that experience. Um, and that's not to say that quirky, interesting rules don't have a place right. and a place in big events. Like I'll give you an example. I'm going down to um, to Slambo in San Antonio yep. in May. Um, I think May is correct. Yes, it is definitely in May. Um, and they have they have um, they have a special rule for each mission. Um, yeah, it's can be quite impactful um, on the game, but they've published their packet well ahead of time. Right. And have said, right, folks, practice to these. When If you're coming to Slambo, practice to these Slambo uh, special extras that we've added to each mission. I'm, yeah. And, I'm, and... I'm good with that. Um, oh totally yeah and i think i think something that's important is like as long as players know what they're get when they're you know what mm -hmm. what they get when they're going um it's it's the worst when you've prepared for something and you don't see the tournament packet and then you show up and you're like wait what are these rules like yeah. <laughs> you know like i wasn't expecting this so you know having the pa having the packets come out in advance being yeah. you know submitting the list in advance like these mm -hmm. are like things that are sort of standard now pretty even much. like three or four years ago were not standard yeah you know? agreed there's um there is a need for transparency in tournament design and execution yeah. um and tools like bcp and other similar systems have helped that enormously uh because mm -hmm. uh, like just just for instance even when i'm not playing tournaments um and people i know are I'm online on BCP at that weekend, you know, while I'm working, doing jobs around the house, watching football, and I'm following on their game, following along on their games on BCP. I'm looking right. at lists, and so you get an increased degree of transparency. You can see who's playing whom, how those pairings have been generated, what lists people are running, and it's it, it's taken a bit of weight off TO's shoulders in that respect because oh, totally. it's not it's not the TO and the TO's crew that are going to catch a list mistake in round one and correct it. It's, it's everybody paying attention to the tournament, whether it's streamed on Twitch or whether it's recorded in BCP and ideally both. Um, it's those, it's those folks, uh, those experts of the game that aren't necessarily at the tournament thing and pick up on those, those, those issues straight away and, and, and help the TOs ensure that like it's all, above board within the rules um so it's, it's fantastic that we've got that as, as a resource now and i like if you're on your laptop at the weekend just like follow along on the on, on the bcp desktop app yeah uh, and look at the lists look at the pairings um and it, it it's, it's really added another dimension to tournaments um where you can go through and you can actually you can actually audit uh, and i find myself messaging tos and going oh 37 points on that mission you, you, you may just want to have a quick <laughs> check of the score sheet there or, or right th that type of stuff because you can audit the game um and and those those tools that present pre that present opportunities for transparency and and remove placings pairings overall standings being a black box that just pops out a number at the end um help increase that transparency and increase that trust in, in the game yeah 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 definitely and I mean you are obviously a veteran you know tournament organizer um, I had several friends who went to Adepticon last weekend um, you know several of which played in the Age of Sigmar tournament mm -hmm. and they had they had a little bit of a snafu with the end of the tournament where they had awarded a best overall performance to um, to Emma yep. and uh, it turned out that she was not the and she wasn't the best per overall performance like they had miscalculated yep. something somewhere um and maybe possibly you know messed up the pairings in round four or five or something like that that affected you know standings and things like that and um so you know i mean look mistakes happen and and yep. i know that they probably feel 
awful about it. And I, I never want to put anybody down for running a tournament because goodness gracious, it's a lot of work, right? And a lot it of is. stuff to put it in. So, yep. um, but from your experience, like running and running a tournament, I mean, we, we touched on some of these already. What are some of the best practices you would say is, is key to running a, like a good event, uh, especially a big one, like a LVO yeah. or a, you know, Atlantic city open or Nova open or something like that. Um, there's a there's a, there's a few really important things. Um, the first is uh, is pushing out detailed information about your tournament uh, beforehand. Say, this is how we're scoring. Mm -hmm. This is these are the missions we're playing. This is how we're scoring in mission. This is how overall standings are being calculated. Be really transparent with that information. There's a li there there has been a little school of thought that you you. You, you, you keep that information secret and you, you surprise the players with it on the day of. That doesn't, to my mind, um, it doesn't actually help uh, grow the game or, or right. maximize people's experience that they have at that tournament. Um, right. Because this isn't a game of chess. There are missions that favor different armies, different builds. There are missions that... Um, aren't necessarily suitable for big events at the moment because of the of various rules interactions. Um, right. So I've narrowed down the 12 and the GHB to eight that I, that I will put forward for, um, for GTs and for major events as, as potential missions, because it takes away some of the quirkiness. It takes away some of the potential negative play experiences. So, um, the marking territory mission where you can end the game when you control all the objectives, just, never include those in a gt because <laughs> right. they, they 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 not only do they risk the negative play experience of like eh, eh, i win you're out um at the end of turn three right they also and we had those in an early gto uh, games workshop open last year um they then mean that you don't necessarily play all five rounds um right. and playing all five rounds is critical in age of sigma 3.0 because you have to be able to demonstrate that you've scored your battle tactic for that round yep so if the game ends in round three hang on can you only score a maximum of three battle tactics or or is it five <laughs> right and so there's been there's been dramas with that over the last year like that's one example the other one uh savage gains they actually played at adepticon um is a nightmare because giants exist. Um, giants can kick the objective out of their deployment zone, which means that the opponent can never score a given number of points for that mission because there's no longer an objective in their opponent's deployment zone. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, slightly it, it, favors those giants, those sons of behemoth. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, definitely it does. Sons of behemoth smash on that. Um, and and the 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 hero the the hero scoring mission. Um, survival of the fittest um i'm gonna go with it's called that or apex predators it's one of the two um mm -hmm. uh sons of behemoth can choose to ignore the objective scoring mission uh, rules within that mission because of their mightier makes rightier rule so again it's not suitable for a competitive gt to have that mission um right. so you, you trim down the missions um and push that information out don't keep it secret and then drop in a curveball on the day of say yeah. hey i've rolled a dice and this is the mission you're playing because that can create some very bad experiences for players because their army simply can't do it um, right right and or they get drawn against giants or they get drawn against um <laughs> against an, 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 an army that's just going to be tailored for that particular mission and if yeah. if, if players get p the missions published beforehand and they tailor their army for one mission great they win one mission what they can do about the other four you know yeah um, yep. So transparency and, and in terms of uh, pushing out information ahead of time and then playing to the information that you've published to the uh, players is critical. Um, Just a quick, quick question on that. How early should you send out your packets? Uh, as soon as you are confident that that's what you're going to play with. So Nova is a perfect example. We are prepping for Nova on uh, the at Labor Day weekend this year. Yeah. Um, Tickets for Nova go on sale on Saturday this week. So as we look at it, uh, Saturday, April 2nd um, at 12 p.m. Everybody buy your Nova tickets. Um, <laughs> but 
I know because every year there is a change to the battle pack that we play in the summer with the GHB season of war whatever it's going to be this year so I'm not going to publish a pack with missions until I know what that looks like yeah right and ideally until I've played it a few times and I understand mm -hmm. where the curveballs are um, so like Nova's at the end of August, start of September, you're probably not going to see a final packet for Nova AOS GT until the end of July. Okay, now. so like a like a month ish. Yeah, and that's that's really driven by timeline. The longer ahead of time you can do it, I do quite like. Uh, so Scott Reed, the LVOTO, is great for pushing out um, prep packets. So he'll say, yeah. "Hey, your missions might come from this selection." Right. So right. you can go away and practice those missions. Here's the scoring system I'm thinking of using, you know? Yeah. Give the players those handrails, those guides to how they might optimize their own performance in your uh, in your event. I think that's a that's that's a big part of it. And then have um scoring systems and pairing systems. And I I'm a fan of BCP. Uh, I've used it since the early days of BCP when it uh, we would sometimes get delays um, right. when we ran huge events and like I ran 500 player 40k events back in the UK um, a number of years ago before they were they were even as, certainly as common as they are now and, and there was there was some b delays with BCP of late I've not seen that BCP works spectacularly well BCP has transparency for everybody playing in the event and anybody who's interested in looking into it as well right. BCP has that so BCP shows you that your pairings have been generated correctly. It shows you that your your events your your rounds have been scored correctly. What it doesn't do is some of the stuff that I associate with, and I call it the bad old days, um, with suboptimal like uh, and subjective entries. So, for example, like this secretly scoring sportsmanship for your opponent. Right. It's a pretty outdated concept. Um, like you you can't you are almost penalized by if you are a gentleman uh, or a, a, a gentle person a good player and uh, someone who plays with max integrity in that instance because uh -huh. when you're scoring your opponent for sportsmanship secretly great that means you feel confident enough to put what you actually think in there it also means that if you are um, a little less honest with it, you will score all your opponents down to hurt their own positions. Right. Um, and if you then don't have a system where you can analyze, where it's public information, who played whom in which round, that could be pretty easy to go through in that situation if that was recorded in BCP and identify players who are consistently scoring their opponents down for sportsmanship mm -hmm. uh, and raise that flag, that question mark. Um, this secretly fell out a piece of paper and hand it into the judges nod nod wink wink it come on it, it that's that it doesn't have a place anymore in um a, what is becoming a a genuine like a true e-sport um so i i have a problem with 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 this with any notion of secret scoring so yeah. a, a a thumbs up thumbs down is good or an assumption of good sportsmanship unless an issue is raised i think is a much more effective way of doing it because yeah. That same that same person who might say I'm going to give everyone three out of five, isn't going to go to a judge to say I'm scoring him down for sportsmanship. Right. Because because then the question is going to be why are you doing that, and didn't you do that in the in the previous round, and didn't you do that in round one? Like those things, um, those things are important, um, particularly if they're going to influence overall placings. Uh, I'm a big fan of the way that ITC splits out hobby and gaming track. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also a fan of uh, differentiating between a best general and a best overall, with your best overall being a combination of sports and sports scored by exception handling um, rather than secret squirreling it. Yeah. Uh, and paint scores and gaming scores, there's your best overall, you know? Right, um, right. Versus your best general, which is just your best overall gaming score. Um, so a transparent scoring pairings system that is visible to everybody and critically for to experience updates instantly that you don't have to try pivoting spreadsheets and matching <laughs> and all of those type right. of things that introduce human error 
as a possibility into the system. Um, so anything that's going uh, anything that's going to introduce transparency into how how your how your match is um, is scored, paired, and then standings um, are presented. Now, BCP for big events like you tell them what you want to go in there, and they will create a custom entry for you. Um, so like it, it, it's there's no longer any excuse for like doing all your things in a black box and then pushing out a here you go here's the results <laughs> or right, here's right. Here, here here are the prizes we're rewarding with no background and with no detailed information for people to be able to interrogate and go through and and, and make sure that uh that, that, that no mistakes have been made so i think that for the, the the bigger scale your events get the more important that is because the more interest you're going to gain the more people the more sets of eyes that you can have on it and the more support you can get to make decisions correctly yeah um and and i I think the um, the Adepticon TOs did a great job. Do a great job. Um, there was just there was just a miss with some decision making that created the opportunity for human error to to make a to present the wrong result. Right. So what you need to do is you need to engineer out the opportunity to make those human errors. Yep. And yep. that's what that's what was missed. Like. The guys, Thomas, Brendan, they did a fantastic job. They ran a great event. It was a really good event. But there were sort of back-end decisions that would have put them in a much more secure position and prevented those mistakes that ultimately led to the error being yeah. made. It's yeah, definitely. Time. And, you know, it's you mentioned BCP. There are other systems out there. Yeah, of but course there are, yeah. I'm going to be I mean, that's the one I'm, that's the one I'm, I'm most familiar with. It's, well, it's what I use as my reference yeah. point. And and I've seen some of the other ones, and some of them struggle, in my opinion. You know, like there's mm -hmm. good and bad in, in a lot of things. But uh, I do agree with your assessment that I feel like BCP gives that level of transparency that is even difficult in other online scoring systems. You yep. know, I mean, and the thing is, is a lot of those other online systems are just repurposed um, chess kind of match uh, Swiss yeah. pairing type stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, I know Garrett personally, obviously, um, and he's even been on the podcast before. And, you know, he he has designed BCP for wargaming, you know, and it's kind of evolved to include skirmish games and other types of things, you know, like they also run X-Wing and, you know, it's not just Warhammer is what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, and tons of card games like yeah. Magic, Yu-Gi-Oh, and maybe not Magic, Yu-Gi-Oh, certainly. Um, a lot of the a lot of the card games, they, they have BCP interfaces for yeah. And you can set it up however you want, and you can enter, you can have it pair and place in what, whatever, whatever, whatever mechanism you, you determine. Um, right. So it's 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 just it's one of those another one of those things to take stuff off your plate as a TO, um, because like I was I was a TO in the days of manually pairing stuff on an Excel spreadsheet, printing them out and sticking them on the wall. Yep. Yep. Like. <laughs> I'm, a li I'm a little worried when events are still doing that. Yeah. You're like, I know how it was back then. I, yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, one thing I want to ask you about um, is prize support. So yep. I think that uh, Adepticon was a little bit controversial this year in the way that they did prize support. And it was their decision, yep. you know, um, but they decided to do a random drawings for it and i know why right like you don't want the top people just walking home with you know duffel bags full of prizes because they were amazing at everything they did and the guy who was you know just showing up who would really like that keeper secrets model or something like that has zero yeah. shot at getting that so you know that that randomness um helps helps it a little bit um but i was kind of surprised to see that the people who podiumed walked away with no prize support this year um, um they walked, walked away with no at, at least that was uh, according to my yeah. sources who was on the podium um, uh, yes <laughs> so that's that that that, <laughs> that is correct uh they did walk away with really really good quality trophies oh yes absolutely um and you know what i'm 100 percent with adepticon on this one mm, okay um like we all own enough boxes of unpainted gray minis. <laughs> Do you know what I don't own? I own various cabinets full of Warhammer trophies. But I don't own one of those Adepticon medals. Right, right. 
that to me is worth a dozen boxes of keepers of secrets right right and but to the first time attendee at a tournament who goes two and three or one and four but then draws out gets a gets gets a prize that's actually worth more as an experience to them um and maybe they have or haven't been playing this game for as long as as, as we have and therefore own all the models they're ever going to need yeah um but i'm i'm with it's a bold decision do you know and and very bold decision. this is this is a bold decision that i endorse domus and brendan and john for making yeah okay that's an interesting perspective um one of my friends had suggested that um you keep it random right random prize drawings but the more you win the more tickets you get to enter into the pot so Interesting. your, your yeah, chances okay. of yeah, yeah. Uh, winning go up if you win, you know. Yeah. Um, but it's not a you do it's remember, not a done deal. You do remember the, the, the Nova alternative to this, don't you? So Nova awards prize support. Well, it does until this year. I'm now thinking about it very closely. Um, awards prize support to winners. Right. As right. well as, as as well as trophies. Um, but it also, for anyone who loses a game, they get an entry into a lemonade raffle. Uh, yep. and the lemonade raffle can some of the prizes drawn from the lemonade raffle are better than the, the original prize support for the tournaments yeah so definitely there is a way of recognizing games played as much as um as as people winning uh, but i say my, my take on it is that and and garrett and i have talked have talked about this at length because we have our own little uh little sort of tournament company grudge hammer games and our grudge hammer events we're we're moving. We're 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 really seriously considering moving from prize support to really cool trophies. Yeah. Um, because we've all got all the models we're ever going to need to build or paint, and there's no way that I just happen to pick the thing that this player wants uh, oh, right, for, right. to complete their collection. You know, um, or even if I let them, you can slightly address that by having them draw from a table or pick from a table when they win a prize. Um, like Summer Slaughter did with their art. They were giving out full armies last wow. summer. Uh, but that was two prize winners. Um, yeah. Rather than... And they still gave out little decent trophies, actually, to be fair. Um, but I'm, I'm moving more towards, like, the keepsakes, the mementos, things that you're actually going to have on the shelf. Mm -hmm. um, by the time you've moved on from one individual model is, is probably a more rewarding prize than, um, than, a, than a, another box of plastic. So again, it's a bold decision because I know a lot of players are like, "Dude, what?" <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we used to yeah. get we used to get armies for this, you know, or and yeah. and say that kind of stuff. But um, I appreciate the perspective, and I you know I think prize support is an interesting thing. You can get really creative with it and make it very meaningful. Like, yeah. it doesn't have to be a one size fits all. It doesn't yep. have to be the same thing everywhere. And mm -hmm. uh, so you know, being able to find the balance right rewarding the winners while um engaging yeah. those people who didn't win you know i don't this, want to call them losers because they still probably went three and two and stuff like that you know what i mean like yeah. like still this, rewarding this, those I, people is important you're probably right that there's a sweet spot somewhere between the two um and maybe that's that's what we're experimenting in order to find mm -hmm. right now but mm -hmm. um no i do admire the approach that they took there i think it, it's it's a bold decision uh and it it supports more players because the winners get these amazing, awesome brush finish diecast models with uh, medals with really good detailed plaques on the back, um, and players who did weren't quite so successful get another box of bow snakes. Yeah, you know, um, still pretty cool for all of them. Um, right. So it, it it is it is I think there's there's there is a to your point there's probably a, a middle ground to be struck um but um i'm i'm i respect kudos to them for doing that definitely so um shifting gears a little bit yeah uh one of the you you know you talked about being a to for um for games workshop yep. and last year was the first year that they had a lot of their opens right they had yep. the orlando open the new orleans open and the Austin, so Austin opened. Yeah. And was there one more Southern California? There was a there was a finals in um, uh, that they did at the uh, the Games Workshop Warhammer Cafe in 
grapevine in Texas. Okay. All right. Got it. Got it. So uh, wildly successful. They were like very well attended, uh, mm-hmm. even even in the middle of a pandemic, right? So yep. um, that was really cool to see. I, if I'm not mistaken, our friend uh, Caleb Walters won it all. Um, he did, yeah. The um, overall he, champion. He 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 won the overall contest. Um, so, Games Workshop, um, and for both 40k and AOS, uh, split down winners into uh, a best general and a best overall stream. Mm. Uh, and so they had the opportunity there, and then at, at the finals in Grapevine, they played. Um, best overall versus best overall uh and best generals versus best generals so um caleb went through and won the the sort of the best overall stream um in those awards now be interesting to see quite how it's done this year we'll know once we get to the first games workshop open which is coming up at in seattle in wow weeks few five weeks i think oh Um, wow already yeah already and they're only announced fairly recently um but um, the series is back. It's expanded. Um, the, uh, the the Warhammer community article was was bigger, better, and headed out west uh, because mm-hmm. the the events this year are going to take place first up in Seattle, uh, May sixth, then San Diego, uh, June 9th, uh, and then a bit of a gap over the summer, and then two events in October. Firstly in Chicago in October sixth. So I'll be back to Chicago, having just come back there from. Uh, uh, on monday uh, and then <laughs> right. um, and then kansas city um on october 27th and looking forward to both of those and then we've actually announced the finals already which is going to take place down in uh pueblo santa ana in new mexico on november the 17th so two questions um well one's an observation uh i am kind of surprised that not one event was out on the east coast with like east of yep. chicago mm-hmm. you know uh given that you know half of the population of the country lives east of the mississippi you know <laughs> like yes. even in an ohio or something like that you yeah. know like i was a little surprised to see how far out west they were um i i guess last year they were all pretty much located in the deep south right orlando yeah New Orleans, orlando Texas. new orleans uh, yeah, and then, so. uh, then then uh, then over in Austin. So yeah. there were two events which are, were kind of east uh, last year, mm-hmm. and then um, the commitment's always been, or the intention's always been, to to move those events to different communities around yeah. the country because yeah. you want to give those players an opportunity to play at an event, particularly if they're not traveling, folks. So um, there are players who travel to every event, right? Um, like. Our um, friend Caleb is one of those people. Caleb's not going to go to every event. He tends not to to travel to too many. Like you never see Caleb at LVO. He will That's go true. to. That's because he goes he to would, Adepticon. Yeah, uh, so he goes to a bunch of events. But like the, I was thinking of. Uh, you may not have met him yet. You might meet him this week. Are you coming down to play with us at Games Castle this weekend? Uh, not this weekend. I've got Ooh, my son's okay. playing rugby, and I'm coaching. So. Fair enough. Uh, yeah. But this, um, so uh, we're having, uh, so there's a, uh, a gentleman called Tom Guan, who's just recently been added to the uh, the USA Team Worlds team. Um, he travels a lot to play a lot of Warhammer. So I expect to see Tom at pretty much every one of these events, unless there's a clash with Worlds when they're off in Prague. Um, right. So you get players who travel to every event, but at the same time, by moving these events around the country, you give the local players there the opportunity to go play in a commutable distance right at a games workshop run event yep um, yep so i don't anticipate these events being in the same place every year uh, and other cities around the country will get the opportunity to have an event locally in the years coming up assuming that we don't have covid 21 uh, <laughs> yeah hey fingers crossed knock on wood and i'll, I'll do yeah, whatever you need to do knock right on wood, yeah. <laughs> so um yeah i guess you know it's it's interesting because i would have thought that they would do like one out west one in the midwest one in the south one on yep. the east you know what i mean and just kind of spread them out but mm-hmm. you know what like they they probably have the reasons why why they're doing that and um again like you know the the folks out in seattle like having to travel to new orleans last year was a kind of a haul yeah. you know so Indeed. it, it so. certainly was and, <laughs> so and, and just that. think about like think about this as a multi-year series of events yeah, right? yeah there's going to be opportunities uh for the other big communities in the country to have events local to them in forthcoming years not and 
at the same time like the, these are these are cities that have their own scenes they have their own gts right. so i don't anticipate we'll go back to these four cities uh in in the following year like they, these cities are all different to the ones that were from last year and i think yeah, you yeah. see that that pattern repeated um i think ultimately that i think there's an opportunity to settle uh around certain areas particularly if there's something central yeah you know uh, where people can travel into whether that's i mean as i look at that map now like kansas city that looks like a good place to go and play a tournament regardless <laughs> of where in the country you're from uh, i don't know it's kind of hard to get to kansas city there's a lot of nothing in between nothing to get there you know <laughs> i i must confess i do have a i do have a um a soft spot for kansas city i was there wow many years ago 11 years ago uh, i went on the british army's uh, sort of staff college exchange to okay. the u.s oh yeah, army, yeah, yeah. Uh, staff college at fort leavenworth yeah i was gonna spent, say leavenworth is like right there yeah. spent a good couple of weeks in kansas city and had one heck of a time yeah so i would recommend it's a good spot i'm not you know i'm not really kansas crappy <laughs> <laughs> it's a good spot i will say though this is this is my second uh, point that i wanted to make right um I am looking for the the FIFA style bribery that got the finals into New Mexico. Okay, somebody okay. had to pay off GW to get the finals into New Mexico, right? Like this so? is like the this is like the Cutter winning the World Cup. Uh, you know, <laughs> I I the, mean I'm a little tug in cheek facetious right now, but I'll be, um, I'll be honest, you know. like. It's going to be pretty beautiful in New Mexico in November, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and I think they have 363 days of sunny skies in New Mexico. Like, literally, there's only, like, two days of a year, two or three days yeah. a year that's cloudy. So um, it'll be it'll be nice. Uh, believe it or not, it'll still be a little chilly out there. Okay. Um, but uh, it'll be it'll I will be take nice. a jacket. Yes, me. exactly. Yeah, you don't need a winter coat, but a uh, jacket will right. be fine. Uh, no, I, you know, I'm being a little facetious because, like, uh, you know, I mean, where is it in Santa Fe? Is that where it's at? Uh, Santa Ana. Santa Ana, which is oh, yeah. close to Santa Fe, I'm assuming. Uh... There's not a lot in New Mexico. Let's, you know, it's so. <laughs> pretty central New Mexico by the looks of the dot. Okay. If they put, if we put the dot on the map in the right place in the Warham, in the Warcom article. Um... Yeah, it's probably somewhere around Santa Fe and, and Albuquerque, which are like not terribly far from each other. So. Um... Yeah, I mean, that's uh, that's an interesting location for finals. But you know, you got to give some of these small places love too, right? So. Oh yeah, for sure. You know. And having... I mean, it looks it looks astonishing. It really does. The yeah. Hyatt Regency Tamaya Resort and Spa. Oh, I bet it's real nice. Nestled uh, in the foot of a desert at the foot of a desert mountain range with sunrises over the Rio Grande, it sounds all right. Um... <laughs> yeah, it sounds all right. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be good. It'll be good. Now, because you are helping run these, like I'm assuming all expenses paid for you, sir, right? Uh, yeah. Like GW cover, GW cover our um, like we're professional tournament organizers. Yeah, professional yeah. Professional event judges. So, um, so they 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 cover that. Um, and I'm, yeah, you know, I feel a little bit bad that I don't get the opportunity or can't get the opportunity to play, in, and I might depending on how many tickets get sold for the earlier events and whether there is space and whether we have sufficient local volunteers to backfill the core team, whether I could play uh, maybe one of the events uh, rather than just being a TO because I want to keep up my, my, my playing career as well as, as my event judging and tournament organizing. I really yeah. do. Um, and I've, I've had to be quite forensic or, or detailed with my, year planning for the events that i'm going to run versus the events i can play at so i'll play at every at lvo every year yeah. gw does send a crew down there i could work for gw uh, but it would be more sort of general duty stuff that kind of thing that i did at adepticon right um so i'm always going to play at lvo i'm always going to be to at nova well at least for now yeah. <laughs> until they yeah. don't want me to anymore um and then i then find gts and major events that i can go to and Th th there are only so many weekends in the year so give you an example um the san diego event um for gw clashes with atlantic city open 
I mean, they couldn't be better located for events to clash. One in San Diego, one in Atlantic City. Right. Um, right. So both events will be roaring successes. But I would love to have played in Atlantic City, but I'm not. I'm going to go in TO at San Diego. I gotcha. Um, another great lo- local, another great event on the East Coast. Not even really on the East Coast, because in Rochester, New York, it's kind of on the Yeah, lakes. that's definitely Northeast, yeah. Yeah. Um, is the same time as the finals. Ah, uh, okay. For, for GW. So I won't for the first time in three in the first for the time in the last three times that it's been run i won't go to the boys um because which is uh really i mean it's it's funny because it's in rochester but it is a very well attended event oh yeah it's uh it's i mean it's slightly bigger on the aos side than it is on the 40k side now at least in maybe maybe not in total player head uh, player head count but in terms of, of reputation yeah you get the best players from the east coast and most of the u.s and also a lot of the Canadians coming down as well to play at Du Bois. Um, yep. And Canadians actually won Du Bois this year. Um, interestingly enough, because Caleb and I were the uh, best overall and best general at Du Bois that previous time it was run. Um, and so the, the Canadians are all over that event as well. Um, so it's 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 going to be a shame uh, that there are clashes, but there are really not. The growth of tournaments means that there is something somewhere around the country at, at, at a large scale pretty much every week. Which is wild. Mm. That's yep. so wild. I'd and... say Q1 of the year, it's quieter. Yeah. Like you yeah. want to run an you want to run an event, you decom in, you do it in Q1, deconflict it with LVO and, and Adepticon, yeah. you'll be in a good spot. I, I'm assuming the reason why there aren't as many events in in Q1 is because everybody just got a brand new army for Christmas and they're still painting, right? <laughs> yeah, quite possibly. <laughs> I, 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 some some regions play more events at the start of the year. Canadians seem to do a lot. If you look, Canadians are top of the ITC at the moment because uh-huh. they've had a bunch of GTs already. Uh, the Pacific Northwest has always front-loaded their events. But in general terms, certainly in my personal experience, my largely East Coast with a little bit of Midwest and Texas experience, uh, they seem to be stuff later in the year. Mm. Um, and I think it's also in part due to so many uh, tournaments following the ITC sort of seasons um and lvo right. being the the big season ender the finale of the itc um they you then almost have a bit of a you have a month off a bit of breathing space yeah yeah for sure for sure very good well uh let's let's end it on this uh i know this is not a gw um official tournament but you have a major hand in the nova open that's coming up in end of august beginning of september I do, yeah. So um, I'm the sort of head of the AOS game system of games for Nova. Um, Nova's changed a lot. Um, it, well, in that it's it, the original founding family of Nova have stepped away um, because Mike Brandt has gone to Games Workshop and therefore sort of had to step back from Nova as not to have a conflict of interest there right so there is a there is a new team of uh local owners for nova um and they are very much carrying on the same type of convention so can i can i ask you who's on the team what in terms of the owners yeah uh not me i can tell you that i I really i really can't say to (laughs) sort of say that it's that everybody but they have a they have a it's much more of a, a sort of a a company in the sense that it has a board of directors okay. um, and various sort of c-suite level positions now um who they're running the same type of convention in that the goal of the convention is to raise as much money as possible for local charities and to bring the community together and provide an exceptional resource an exceptional experience for gamers in order that a lot of money is raised for uh, deserving charitable causes. Yeah. Um, so they're keeping that ethos 100% alive um, whilst expanding uh, the Nova Open. So uh, back after two years of, of being out due to COVID, um, we've expanded the, the venues. Um, so still based around the same hotel, the Hyatt Regency in Crystal City, yep. but also the... The hotel immediately across the street from the entrance to Hyatt Regency, the Renaissance, is also part of the convention now. And all of the AOS system of games are moving across the street oh, wow. into the Renaissance. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, 
and what that's done is it's opened up the the total the total space available for age of sigmar yeah. and all the ancillary events uh and basically given us more space more time um so that we can run uh, a bigger set of age of sigmar events so again we'll be starting on the thursday we'll be running the the events that you'll be familiar with the, the doubles the rtt the gt um but the space and time available has, has meant that, that I've been able to add a few things. Um, first and foremost, an invitational tournament. Um, right. 40K has always had an invitational at Nova, and it's always been the biggest or the most prestigious invitational that's been running. Um, AOS is going to have a 16-player invitational, four rounds over one day, um, sort of single elimination for 16 very well-known AOS players mm -hmm. um, that's going to be run on the Thursday. And... Uh, Roger Barker, um, a, quite a famous AOS player. Um, I like Roger quite a, a lot. well known. Yeah, and an, a, a true gentleman uh, is going to be running that uh, that invitational event, um, and it's quite cool. He's largely kept his plans to himself, uh, so I will be as, as surprised as everyone when that format comes out <laughs> in a little bit more detail this weekend. Um, so Roger's going to run uh, an invitational event. I'm going to expand the uh, the the GT at Nova to be a an eight round event from a five round event oh very so cool. we'll do five rounds 200 players and then we'll cut to a top eight after the fifth round then play a three round single elimination sort of top eight tournament so we'll do a first round on on saturday so that so thursday we're going to have the doubles we're yep. going to have the invitational and possibly an rtt at the moment we're saying rtt on the thursday the change of venue means we may also be able to do that on the sunday instead okay but we'll have those events on the thursday then friday saturday we'll have the main part of the the gt um but also over that time we'll be running war cry events underworlds events um all of the age of sigma system of games all mm -hmm. those age of sigma ip type events will be running um we'll run a five round gt we'll cut to top eight we'll run a sixth round on saturday evening to leave a sort of a final four and then a uh, a final uh, on the sunday but then because we've moved from the old uh, Regency Ballroom, where we needed to give that space up on Sunday afternoon so that we could run the um, the awards ceremony. Do yep. you remember? Yep. The, yep. The, the hall, we used to have to clear that hall so yeah. that they could do the awards. And it was there. like, oh, I'm not quite done with my game, but thanks for taking my chair. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so thankfully, that's gone. Like, we've got this this hotel for the weekend. So uh, one of the, the organizers was like, hey, James, why, why do you have so much on a Thursday and not much on a Sunday? I was like, well, you always used to take the hall off us. And he was like, yeah, but you're in a different hotel now. We're not taking a hall off you anymore. So I was like, oh, okay. So I'm yeah. going to sit down with them to look at what we can potentially run on a Sunday instead. And, and that will all get ironed out prior to tickets going live on Saturday. Um, and then uh, we've also got, I said Warcry. Um, we've got Underworlds. Uh, we've got, Oh, uh, Age of Sigmar Soulbound, the RPG. Oh, yeah, We're going nice. to run some of that as well. Um, and we'll be over in a hotel uh, in, across the street, the Renaissance. And uh, so it's going to open up twice the number of hotel rooms <laughs> that it was before because there's a bunch of hotel rooms there available as well. Yep. Reduce some of the burden on those elevators going up and down. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, sometimes uh, that was uh, a real pain. It was. Um, but we'll have our own bar, our own food. We'll have everything that we need to run a successful convention um while still having a very nova open feel and being part of the nova open itself we're not we're not we're not because we're not rep replicating seminar rooms we're not replicating uh yeah. nova open foundation the foundation lounge you know the big upstairs party cocktail bar thing right uh, right we won't have one of those but i've walked the distance between the hall um and the 40k hall it's still only five minutes and it used to take two minutes before you know right um, right so it's it's still going to be the Nova Open as that we know and love, but it's also just going to have a bit more space and a bit more opportunity to to grow. Um, One of the things I really liked about LVO was the amount of space that we had. Right, it didn't feel like a cramped area um, no. where everybody was just stacked on top of each other, and you know where you're like, oh, like I can barely put my models here because I've got you know. I, I'm we're like Matt to Matt to Matt to Matt to Matt, you yep. know, type of type of thing. Mm -hmm. And you stand up and you bump into the guy that's behind you playing on the other table, right? So um, LVO like had a nice, lot of nice space there 
to be able to mm. do that. And it sounds like we'll have um, similar space because we'll be, you know, Age of Sigmar will be the, the king in the Renaissance Hotel. Yeah, that's the that's the idea. Um, that it was. It was. A, I think it's. I, I. I. It was a decision that I that I, I. I. helped sort of try and drive awesome. to move move us across because there's tons of other things that can go into those rooms that we used on the far side on the in the original hotel. Yeah. Like the the kill team live the games workshop uh, like laser tag event which is amazing. Uh, will can now run across in, in the in the the height regency so it just gives more opportunity more space more room for growth more right. um more more scope to expand the convention and make it even better than it what than it has been before i'm i'm so looking forward to it it's, it's going to be great i'm really looking forward to it too i'm glad it's back i was really bummed in the last two years right that like maybe it'll happen this year and it just it didn't and you know that's okay we all understand why mm. um but you know the fact is is that with it being back like i'm i'm really excited for it it's always one of those that i i really look forward to i absolutely take time off of work to go yeah to go do that and it's you know it's over the labor day weekend so the nice mm -hmm. the nice thing is that you have monday to recover from yep. the tournament and you i remember you definitely need it <laughs> i remember um what was it it was 2019 that we played and i ended up playing uh it was like 11 games of warhammer in 3 days yeah. and like on monday just being like Strong. okay please please just like i can't touch another model for a little while like i was just mm -hmm. so done you know and uh uh, you know, fortunately, I didn't burn out any flame that I had for Age of Sigmar. It was still there, right? Yeah. It just was. Uh, it was a long weekend, and I needed that Monday for sure. Yeah, so, definitely. But it's um, a it's, great it's, weekend. It's a real. I'm delighted that it's that it's back and that it's it's managed to survive the pandemic. Um, we, we, and we're gonna have an exceptional time. I can't wait. Well, and I'm glad you know, like I didn't, I didn't. Uh, uh, I didn't know the previous owners very well, uh, just just by okay. name only, you know. And mm -hmm. so I'm glad that um, folks like you that I do know are involved because I got a lot of faith in what you guys are doing, you know. And so I, I've seen you I guys run. That. I've Thank seen you. you run tournaments before. I've been in your tournaments, mm -hmm. and they're always a, a pleasure to be in and, and, and play in. So I got a lot of faith for what's coming up for sure. Yeah, and and the the great thing is that we still have the, this partnership of the convention with – games workshop and all the other game manufacturing companies that nova open hosts everyone wants to be involved yeah so you still get that those convention exclusives those things that only the games manufacturers can bring but at the same time it's an independently run convention that is there to boost the community and to raise money for exceptionally deserving causes so it's fantastic absolutely absolutely well james i'm excited for all of these events that you're in i'm kind of jealous that you get to go and and you know get feed off of that energy firsthand because yeah. uh, you know all those tournaments man they're they're exciting there's a there's a fun there's a fun energy at, at these things and uh you know you get, you get to experience it you get to you know set these players up for success Mm -hmm. um you know as, as you go about it and uh i can't think of a better person at the helm so uh, i you know. appreciate that thank you yeah it's great to yeah hear. yeah you, you, you do a great job so um uh hopefully we can have you back on the podcast like near the end of the Love year to. and get a yeah. report on how everything went mm -hmm. and maybe some lessons learned you know yeah no that so. would be that would be really useful um and I'd, I'd, I'd be happy to do so um and hopefully i'll get time to talk about like playing in tournaments as well as just just toing them <laughs> yeah true um i do know what we're going to do actually you are definitely coming back on the podcast because i want to do a list review of the nova open um cool you know yeah. it kind of like mm -hmm. uh what uh sometimes like the honest war gamer does or some of these other guys Se Se yeah season of war yeah um yep. they're most they're, they're doing great list reviews now season of war who are going to be my aos streamers for uh nova open oh okay well are yeah. are, are they going to do a list review of the nova open they will do a list review of the Nova Open, but um, okay. we should do a competing list review of the Nova Open as well. Okay, um, we we definitely can. We'll get a couple of uh, yeah. a couple of our experienced. We should players get a couple on. of a couple a couple of ringers in to uh, to 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 see what they suggest are going to be the top list, and we compare that we can compare them to how Season of War, uh, Jordan and Ridge and Carl and those guys get on with uh, 
with their uh, with their list predictions. Oh, this sounds like fun. This sounds like yeah, it's going it to be a lot doesn't of fun. It? And uh, I I uh, am going to say that we are looking into upgrading some of our podcasting software so okay. that we'll be able to do video and like throw those li- you know throw those up on a screen and mm-hmm. uh, talk through it together and so we could stream it onto YouTube and Twitch and all that stuff too. That would be fantastic. So, that, yeah. that that would be amazing. Um, particularly yeah, cool. No, so that, that sounds people like a great look, idea. Check out the list and look at it mm-hmm. while we're while we're yammering on. Yes. So. <laughs> so, um this sounds like a lot of fun. So, we're definitely going to get set up for that and uh, obviously we'll be in touch to plan it out as we get closer. So, Cool. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Um, thank you. Always yeah. a pleasure. Yeah, definitely. Uh for for our listeners again out there, you know, follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, and uh, you know, if you've been listening to this, give us a like, a thumbs up. If you're on Apple Podcast, leave us a review. That always helps sometimes. So uh otherwise, uh just smash the like button, share it with your friends, do what you can and and throw us some topics. If you're interested in hearing about uh different things of about Warhammer or what you're interested in, let us know and uh we've got connections that we can find people to talk about it, that's for sure. So Uh, Thank you again, James, and uh, everybody else, have a good night. Thank you. Bye.